Hello, hello, everyone. Why don't our amazing um, presenters start to introduce yourselves? Since Danny hasn't done one of these before, Holly, why don't you kick us off and unmute yourself and give us a grand introduction. Well, hello. I'm super, super excited to be doing one of these again. Um, and also, even though it's over Zoom, talking to people without a mask on my face. Um, my name is Holly Jenkins. I'm a first violinist in the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. I joined in 2016. Um, I did Credo my, after my senior year of college, so in 2012. And since then, I've done work here and there for Credo. Last summer, I did some private lessons and classes and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I did a fireside and a couple lunches. So I know a few of you. Um, Esme, I saw you on there. It's really good to see a picture of your face because you don't want to show us your face. <laughs> Hi, Esme. <laughs> so that's me. Hey, all. Um I'm Sarah Grimes. Uh, I'm the first violinist in the Minnesota Orchestra, and I joined in 2016, um, and I went to Credo in high school in 2009, um, and I also taught a little bit this past summer for Credo Online, so um, yeah, I did one of these firesides, so I might be repeating myself if anyone was at that other one, but you see well. Hi everyone, I'm Danny Lai. I play viola in the Chicago Symphony. I joined in uh, 2014. Yeah, 2014. And um, yeah, I've actually never been to Credo myself, but I do know Peter pretty well. We've just ran into each other a lot of times. I actually studied with him a couple lessons at Chautauqua. I don't know if he remembers that. But. Um. He remembers everything, Danny. <laughs> he really does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ashley, just so you know, I don't know if there's like a te technical things, but like you sent me another Zoom link, which uh -huh. when I tried that one, it didn't. I don't know. Like the wrong. Perfect. Okay. Well. Let me, I think a couple of people are having that same question, are having that same issue. And so I'm actually, well. you, you did? Mm -hmm. Okay. The first one yeah. asked me for a password and then I went to the older email and that other link let me in. Right. Awesome. I had to click awesome. on the older email to find this room. Well, I'm glad you um, motored through there and I am going to go find that, that older link because I'm guessing that's where Peter, Peter is in some sort of La La, -la Land Hello. zone. No, he's yeah. here. <gasps> oh, is he here? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Welcome yeah. back. Sorry about the link, Peter. That's okay. So we have people here. This is good. <laughs> we have lots of people here. That's awesome. Peter, we have just introduced um, we have just introduced ourselves while we were work ironing out a couple of uh, link glitches, and um, so we're we were just about to dive into some of your awesome questions. Do, do you have anything you wanted us to start with? No, it's just nice to see everybody. So go for it. Perfect. All right. So where is my List. Let's get started with Holly. I just sort of, I sort of want us to um, sort of get in sort of a, a kickoff mode. Talk, talk to us a little bit about um, sort of what your background with orchestral music has been. So things like how long you've been, I think you might have mentioned how long you've been um, over there. And then, you know, was orchestral playing your main goal when you were in high school? I mean, was this what mm -hmm. you always wanted to do? And um, is, your, is this your first pro gig or how many orchestras did you audition before you got this job? Sure, okay, so um, I'm not sure I ever had a super clear idea of what I wanted to do with music until I was about 21 maybe. Um, I'm pretty sure I was just gonna like, I don't know, play violin and somehow magically make money or something, um, unclear. Uh, as we do, you know, 
Um, and it wasn't until I was in my second year of master's and like the reality of student loans was becoming sharper and sharper. Um, Cause I've got, I've got a decent amount of debt here and I needed, you know, things like health insurance and to be able to pay my rent. And it just, you know, all of the like, you know, I was living in New York and I was like going from Manhattan down to like Brooklyn and Queens and over to Jersey to teach. And it was just so much exhaustion doing the freelance work. And I was getting to a point where I didn't necessarily feel secure in any of my skills. I was not having a good time at all. And, you know, those of you who have talked to me over the summer and stuff or heard anything that I talked about, like it was getting really depressing. It was really super not fun. And so uh, my second year of master's, I was having a lesson with my teacher and crying as per usual. And my teacher was like, you know, Holly, what if there was a job where you could get health insurance and a regular paycheck and go to one place for it? And I was like, what? <laughs> Heaven forbid, that sounds impossible. And so that's when I started taking auditions. And I think before Baltimore, I think I took four other auditions. Um, and I, most of my orchestra experience was like, you know, St. Louis Symphony Youth Orchestra, um, you know, college orchestra at Oberlin, orchestra at Manhattan School of Music, lots of pickup gigs. I was in um, the orchestra now for its uh, first year and that gave me the, the time and um, income a little bit to be able to actually take auditions. So I think it's a lot of it is just about like having the right situation. And so like even within those four auditions, like my whole audition like idea and um, way that it worked changed drastically. Um, you know, and you really just need to find what works for you. But yeah, so I've been in the BSO now for nearly five years. Um, I started in the second violins, which I loved. Um, and then moved over to the firsts a couple years ago because I wanted to play above third position a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's long story short. There I am. Why would you want to play above third position? I don't know. I was just, I was feeling too much like a viola, Danny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Danny. Let's, let's talk to you the next, that, that same sort of set of questions. Talk to us a little bit about um, how long you've been there, what the audition process looked like for you. Sure. Um, so I started getting serious about music when I was 16 because of an orchestra experience. So I did the Allstate in Colorado and we played the first movement of Mahler II. And that was the first time I really had like an orchestral experience that really touched me and moved me. And, you know, when you're a teenager, um, there's so many question marks, you're dealing with a lot, so many different things happening. Um, and like, for instance, I mean, since this is a credo thing, I did grow up in the church, but when I was a teenager, I had a lot of doubts and I, I, I stopped going to church and stopped believing in just a lot of different crises. Um, but this orchestra music, this ex orchestra experience was just touched me to my soul. And so ever since then, I've been wanting to play music. And um, yeah, being a violist and studying music, I realized very quickly that the only way if I, to do music as a career for me would be to try and get into an orchestra. So I started preparing for auditions like my sophomore year of college is when I really first started. So pretty early. I think a lot of people's stories like Holly, they, they play for the love of it, but they don't really think about like, if I want to do this for the rest of my life, how is that going to look? But um, yeah, I was able to get ahead of the game, which was really helpful, I think. So I've started taking auditions. My first audition was, my first professional audition, I think was my junior or senior year or something for Grant Park Music Festival. And I got into the semifinals, that my first audition. So that was kind of like a moment of um, confirmation for me that 
I probably had the skills to be able to do it. So that was really encouraging for me. Um, and then I got uh, my job in the Colorado Symphony in 2013 after I graduated and then got the job in Chicago the year after that. Are those the only orchestras? Was that three orchestras that you auditioned for? Uh, no, I, I also okay. auditioned for other orchestras. I probably took like eight, let's see. Yeah, I auditioned in San Francisco, New York, North Carolina. I had to leave, end up leaving halfway through the audition because I got called to sub for the CSO for the first time. And I was like, it was a choice between doing that or playing in the finals in North Carolina. And I thought it was actually a pretty hard decision, but I ended up leaving the audition. And I think actually I made the right decision. I took a big risk, but paid off. Why, why do you think for, for our students sake, why, why do you think that was the right decision? Um, Cause for me at the time, once you start having success at auditions, it kind of gives you the, it gives you, it definitely gives you more confidence coming out of them, knowing like if, if you can make it past the first round of audition, that means you have some promise. And like, I, there are auditions I didn't get out of the first round and those are really discouraging. I'm, I'm not going to deny that that happens quite often, but when you start having success, it also shows that you're onto something. There's something about your playing that professional musicians like and want to, to play with. So um, for me, getting into the finals for that audition, it made me realize, look, if I can do this at this point, I think I was a junior or just seen, no, I, th I think that was my fourth year of college. I was in a five-year program. And so doing that, I realized like, I could probably have a, if I'm good enough to get this far, I can probably get a job in the future, but an opportunity to play with one of the greatest orchestras in the world that I was growing up with because I was at Northwestern. So the Chicago Symphony was the hometown orchestra, you know, I thought this is a chance that I can't really pass up. And I learned a ton. Yeah, doing that experience that I wouldn't have picked up that kind of experience just doing auditions. So do you feel like you met some important people by oh, yeah. doing some of that play? For sure. Yeah. That's a big part of it too. Like the more, I think the more people that you know and are able to reach out to for help, the better. Um, I'm never one who was afraid to ask people for help. Whenever there was an audition, I would ask everybody and anybody I knew to listen to, to my playing. That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. So Sarah, popping it over to you. Tell us a little bit about your audition experience. How long, and how long have you been in Minnesota now? Um, well, I have been in the orchestra for about five years, I guess. Yeah, I joined in um, like October of 2016. But I actually, so I'm from Minnesota originally. And I um, was, I was playing as a substitute player in the Minnesota Orchestra for a couple years before I won that job. So, um, and then I also, <laughs> in that, in that time, I also spent a year doing um like a like a one-year contract with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra so I kind of had this unique experience of being able to um well at least for one year I was kind of playing with both orchestras um and this was just a time when you know they they had the need for subs and so um that was a really really valuable um kind of learning experience for for me you know and that was that was right after I was also at Northwestern. Um, and the first, I guess the first orchestral audition I took was for the Minnesota Orchestra. And it was for the position of, um, of a sub or um, they were also hiring uh, one year players during that time. So this was right after the, the lockout that happened in Minnesota Orchestra, if you know anything about that. But um, so that was the first audition that I took and that was like, that kind of coincided right with when I was finishing school and I was also finishing a year um, in the Chicago Civic Orchestra and so that is sort of a training program that um, that sort of is meant to help you prepare for these kinds of auditions and I just remember being really really <laughs> just unimaginably nervous and and also I think my self-esteem at that point was like you know it was 
very low and I, I just felt like I was stepping out into this huge unknown and taking this audition, I sort of felt like, you know, was, was more for my own benefit than anything. And I think that might've been a good outlook on it, except it definitely prevented me from being like fully prepared <laughs> for the entire audition because I actually got to the end of that audition and I was like, not ready to play the, um, the chamber music round at the end because I like I had convinced myself that it was just like not possible that I would ever reach that point. So that was that was kind of a huge, you know, learning experience and just, you know, a point where I had to just say to myself, like, okay, you are living in the real world now. There's no excuse. And, you know, and and, and I sort of had to had to like <laughs> start believing in myself a little bit more. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of what the audition process was like. Um, as far as my, my sort of like history with orchestral music, my, both my parents are musicians um, and my dad is a trumpet player. So he, you know, was taking a lot of orchestral auditions when I was young. And so I kind of had a little bit of knowledge of, um, you know, what a hard process that was and um, you know, some of the stresses that came along with that. Um, so I feel like, like I, you know, I, I sort of went into college thinking, you know, I definitely knew that I, I was interested in chamber music and orchestral music, just kind of that more collaborative music making as, you know, like a general interest of mine, but I didn't really know that I would end up playing in orchestra or anything, but I think I just tried to seek out opportunities to play with other people just because I like it. But um, I also played in youth symphony. Um, and that I also like, I think attribute a lot of, you know, a lot of the reasons why I think I've been able to, to end up where I am is because at a young age, I was able to play all of this orchestral repertoire that was much, much too hard. <laughs> you might argue, uh, for someone my age, like I remember, you know, I, I played the Rite of Spring in this orchestra and it was like, you know, we worked so hard and I was like 13 and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, but you know, but I was really serious about it and I, I feel really grateful that I was even given that chance and, and this group of kids was even I don't know, like, you know, I, I just feel like that was a, a great testament to, um, you know, challenging kids rather than trying to put on a really solid performance for the sake of, you know, how your, how your symphony, you symphony will look and whatever. Um, so I was really, you know, grateful for that experience and the way that it, it sort of like gave me a taste of what it felt like to work really, really, really hard as an ensemble. Um, and have these really uh, rewarding performances. So, yeah, that's so. So, Sarah, you have you've you've talked about sort of four different levels of orchestral playing. So, youth orchestra, which many of us are are familiar with, and then civic, and then subbing with a couple of different professional orchestras before landing your job. Talk to us a little bit about the difference between civic being sort of a professional training orchestra and then going and working with the um, primarily professional orchestras. How was that, how did that, how was that different for you mentally and in your playing? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> it's, it's funny, I almost don't remember, but <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> you know, like I, I think, you know, there were a lot of things that, that Civic helped prepare me for, and you know, we would have mock auditions and all of this stuff. Um, but it's interesting, we had sort of a, our, the director of that at the time was this really um, eccentric guy and, um, you know, we would always, re I remember we would always, like Peter? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no, this guy, he, he always had the metronome on, like, we would rehearse, like, the entire time with a metronome. It was all these sort of, like, things where looking back now, I'm like, that really you know, that really wasn't true to, to, you know, what you would experience in a professional orchestra. Um, so I think a lot of the, I don't know, it, it, it was an interesting, uh, 
uh, journey. Cause we, yeah, we would have this, this guy who would, who would rehearse with the orchestra and then, um, uh, it, it was the great thing about Civic was that we had the chance to work with all of these great conductors who would come into the Chicago Symphony. So like Jaap von Sweden was there, like we got, you know, he, he was there conducting the CSO and, um, and he came and worked with Civic as well. And he conducted our concert, but of course he wasn't there. You know, we, we had, you know, tons of rehearsals leading up to the concert. So that, that probably actually is the biggest difference is that we rehearsed for like, you know, six weeks or something for one concert. Um, so it was just, you know, the process was really different. You know, we would rehearse with this guy and we would do all these really in-depth sectionals and, and then the, the conductor would come in and often have like a completely different interpretation. And we'd already been rehearsing for so long that we're used to whatever we were doing. And then we had to sort of pivot completely. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it definitely taught us some flexibility and it gave us this really great opportunity to work with the kind of conductors that you would work with in a professional orchestra. But, you know, the preparation process as an ensemble was like completely different, you know. And, and the first time that I played um, in a professional orchestra was like a summer concert at the Minnesota Orchestra. And there was like one rehearsal, you know, it was going to be like the stars and stripes and whatever. And of course I practiced like for like weeks and weeks, <laughs> you know, I was, you know, it was my first, very first time playing professional orchestra. So it's really nervous. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you know, perfectly prepared and like, you know, got there super early and everyone else was just like, oh, it's an outdoor concert. And we've played this stuff a million times. And so um, that was a, that was a big shock going from like, you know, six weeks of prep for any sort of orchestra concert to about, you know, one rehearsal cut short <laughs> for time. So. Oh, go Peter. Well, I, I had an experience when I was a grad student at Eastman and I'd done civic and then done orchestras, you know, in school. And uh, I was sitting my first rehearsal with, I think it was Basil Vandres, who's a terrific, terrific violist who was, who was in New York Phil and San Francisco Symphony and I was principal of Colorado for a long time. Anyway, we were sitting, pardon me? He was my teacher in Denver. Awesome. Denver yeah. so, so we were sitting together and um, this was the first rehearsal with Rochester Philharmonic. And after the intermission, the, the principal, very kind person, came back to us and said, hey guys, hey guys, I've gotten some comments from people around you. You're not, you're not subdividing. You need to, you need to start subdividing. <laughs> And I thought I, I thought I was doing the professional level rhythm and no way was I doing it because I started listening and oh my goodness, everything was counted. Everything was exact. The, my whole training through even something good like Civic did not prepare me for what I was hearing. And so I was alerted to that. But, but I think that rhythm is, you know, for me, that was the biggest distinctive as going from one level to another. And Sarah, you're absolutely right. You know, with, with a thing like Minnesota Orchestra or CSO, Danny, I remember my first time in CSO, we were doing, my first rehearsal was uh, Mahler 7th. Now, who plays Mahler 7th? It was like perfect the first rehearsal. So, so those two things are kind of my takeaways. But, but, they, but Sarah, you're right. Also those preparations, they, the you, things you get in Civic Orchestra now or New World, they're fantastic. They help you a lot, but you have to listen once you get there. Mm -hmm. And now, Holly, did you play in a training orchestra since you had sort of the orchestral revelation of, oh, I can have insurance and have a job? How, what was, how, did you go through the same process or did you do it differently? Um, I went through a similar process because um, I did this training orchestra up at Bard called the Orchestra Now. Um, and that was really like, you know, my first experience really like just orchestra for a year. But I'd also subbed with the St. Louis Symphony for seven weeks um, for their like opera season the summer before. So I'd had somewhat of like a just living in an orchestra type of feeling. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm basically just gonna second everything they just said. Like they're really like, the biggest difference for me was the, um, having, you know, six weeks to learn a program versus you, I literally learn my music, like, as I'm playing the previous program every time, you know, like, 
or, you know, sometimes I'll admit that I'm not always extremely um, responsible and, you know, we have Mondays off and I learned my music on Monday for my Tuesday rehearsal, you know, and it's just totally different now. Like I've developed a completely new skill set of learning music. And Peter is also right about listening to time. Although, you know, it's not always exact. Like every conductor has like a different way. And so like you kind of learn like, you know, fitting like, you know, even like where the ictus is or whatever is totally different. And like, you know, Baltimore Symphony takes time in these specific ways. And we know that our concert master likes spaces between certain things. And you learn about like all these little like ticks that every orchestra has. And like, I know like two years ago, like a year and a half ago, we were locked out for three months and I got the opportunity. This is where I met Sarah actually was when we were locked out and I was subbing with Minnesota. And like every orchestra has all these like little weird things that they do and none of them are bad at all. But like the first rehearsal, you're always like, oh, oh, okay, okay, I see. You know, and there's just like this adjustment period. So definitely always practice everything with a metronome a thousand billion times, but then you're gonna get there and it's not gonna feel that way ever. Yeah, there's definitely also a, a different sense of cohesiveness. I think with any, you know, any professional orchestra, you know, where the members are permanent, you know, when you're coming, even coming from a great training um, program, you know, they're cycling through people all the time because those people are going on and getting jobs and all this. So there's definitely like a different feeling like group sound, like, man. Yeah, you're just kind of jumping on board something you really have to be um, you know, really intuitive, like, and, and flexible, and, you know, sort of know how to, know to how to adapt to, yeah, to those different groups, and, and yeah, it's just kind of a different, a different feeling, like, there's just a, you know, a common knowledge that people develop when, you know, when you're in, you know, so many people are in these orchestras for 20, 30, 40 years, so, um, you definitely feel like you're joining something that's that's already existing and you kind of have to give yourself up to that in a way, um, you know, and you do bring hopefully your your own strengths to that as well. But like, you know, when, when you play in a something like New World or Civic or something, you know, you're kind of developing those ensemble skills together and like getting to know each other's playing at, you know, simultaneously rather than kind of one person joining at a time. So. I would say going into those experiences, like playing with an orchestra, I like pretty much have to give up any ego I had and just Ooh, be like, that's good. Like, I don't know. I don't know how y'all play this. Like, I'll just blend. Uh, okay. Like, I see you. Gotta you be like, like a violist. I, I do my best. We all know it's a better instrument. <laughs> well, this is, guys, this is such good stuff. You, talking to you is already just so fun and so enlightening. So I want to pivot a little bit and I'm going to, this is, we're going to take one of um, the questions that Peace Love sent out and um, we're going to talk about both sides of the coin. Favorite part of your job? And is there anything at your job that bothers you? And true, honest, honest opinions here. I don't want, we don't need to sugarcoat anything. You know, there's going to, there's always stuff that bugs us, but really what are the things that it's good to know that are awesome about your job and what are things that are good to know that are like you know can rub you the wrong way let's see uh who should talk first who wants to go first danny wants to go first danny okay perfect you just got voluntold yeah i can go because then i have to put my kid to bed oh yeah go yeah <laughs> perfect um my favorite part of the job is probably when we go on tour the cso tour is like you normally about four weeks every year and when we go on tour it's like not that we don't try hard in our own hall but we definitely try harder when we're not at home um i think it's a mixture of wanting to make sure we have we maintain our reputation around the world and also playing in new different spaces forces us to listen harder and it's a lot of different factors but yeah going on tour not to mention i just love traveling and seeing all these different places and i'm getting paid to do it so that's where, awesome. where have you been with the orchestra <laughs> where have you traveled um so all over europe 
uh, and okay, so I guess for instance, I think our last tour was in Europe. It was like Germany, France, Switzerland, um, Italy. Uh, we've been to Denmark, Poland. And then in Asia, we'd go to like China, Korea, Japan, uh, Taiwan. Uh, yeah, those are the main ones. And then we usually do like domestic tours. So like all up and down California, New York, almost all the time. We do Florida. A lot of orchestras are going to Florida now because it's cold in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, fantastic. So you've basically been everywhere with the orchestra. Not everywhere. We were supposed to go to South America a couple years ago, which I was super excited about. We were also supposed to go to Cuba, and I know Minnesota went there, so that kind of killed it for us because they were like the first ones to get there. And once you're the first, it's like, oh, well, someone's already done it. Well, actually, I think it was mostly a money problem. But yeah, I still, we still haven't been to South America since I've joined, which I'm sad about. But. That's awesome. So flip the coin. What 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 is the what what is the minor irritation about your job? So, well, when you're in an orchestra for a long time, there's also 99 other people who have also been in an orchestra a long time, mostly. So I think it's it's kind of like your family. Like, I mean, it is your family. Like you spend a ton of time with them, and you can't choose who they are. Like. Once they're tenured, you, you can't kick your brother out of your family. It's the same with an orchestra. So if there's ever any pers interpersonal issues, it's, it's not like with other jobs where it's like, well, I can always just leave this team and go to another team. Or, you know, I'll just move to a different industry. I mean, orchestra positions are pretty, pretty fixed. So, I mean, I don't want to be that guy's like, but there's the positive side. But you do have to learn how to deal with people. And um, I definitely had to learn how to separate work from home and like mentally. Because I think my first couple of years, my work was like my whole life. Like everything I did revolved around my work. And I just want to do my best. And I want to be friends with everyone and do this and that. But there's, it's definitely healthy to keep some mental space between um, your work and your home life. That's something I learned. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Sarah, give us the two sides of your coin. I'll be right back. Go for um, it. Thank you, Danny. Well, I think the, you know, my, I have a lot of favorite things about, about my job. And, you know, one of those things is, like Danny was saying, the sort of familial aspect and the relationships that you get to create and, um, you know, and yeah, we, we go on tour together, we spend all this time together, like you do really um, get to know people very, very well. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's what I would say. My, my favorite part is just sort of having this community and, um, and a community of support. Like, you know, I, I joined after this 18 month lockout that happened in Minnesota. So there, definitely, you know, if there was, if there was a feeling of cohesiveness before, I don't know, I think there was, but definitely after that, you know, that whole experience that they went through, you know, it's such a supportive community and the musicians, you know, always have each other's backs in whatever, whatever situation. So kind of coming into that, I, you know, I felt really lucky to, to sort of, you know, have that support and encouragement. And I, I, you know, I can't speak for other orchestras and I don't, know what it's like but I always um you know I'm always really grateful like people in my orchestra will like go out of their way to say you know good job on this chamber music thing or you know like it was great to sit with you and like and so we kind of have you know a, a good environment going I think and I really am thankful for that um <laughs> and I guess I'd say the the flip side is um you know, it's something that I didn't totally think about, um, but you know, it's a job. It's a nine to five, not nine to five, but like, you know, with all your practice and stuff, you know, it is a full-time job. And, um, and I think 
it can be easy once you kind of once you kind of start going down the road of becoming like jaded about certain things or just like having a bad attitude about certain you know like we play all these subscription concerts and then we play like a lot of pop stuff and sometimes that can be like a little bit like mindless you know whole notes and stuff you know um and i think you know there are a lot of people that have a good attitude about it and i think you know in my orchestra especially like what i really love is that if we're ever in that situation i think there's a majority of people who have just decided as like the culture of the orchestra that we're just going to have fun with it so rather than just sort of like turning off and being bored and whatever like um you know we're just going to have fun with each other and like make it you know make it a fun time uh because you know we're we're still grateful to be there so um i think that's <laughs> that is something that I, I noticed early on. I, I noticed that, you know, maybe there are certain people who I'm like, man, they just seem kind of miserable sometimes. Like, and I don't know if I, I want to fall into that. And I, and I did realize actually how, how easy it can be to sort of like, you know, if someone's complaining to you about something, you're like, oh yeah, like, um, it can kind of be easy for that to rub off on you, at least for me. So I had to kind of make, you know, this conscious realization at some point, like, you know, I want to, you know, always take the, you know, the bird's eye view of everything and just like be grateful for the job that I have. And like, <laughs> if I have to play a pops concert, like whatever, like we're just going to have fun and like, <laughs> you know, enjoy just like being together. So yeah, I think that's the, the other you, thing. You uh, sound like you, you sound like um, mental attitude and sort of coming from a space of being where you're supposed to be and having gratitude for that um, is really important. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing that I've, <laughs> especially in recent years, like they don't tell you that when you join an orchestra, at least in my orchestra, there are a ton of committees and other ways that uh, musicians serve uh, and especially during like this quarantine time when we haven't been performing as much you know those duties were uh, um, you know sort of doubled and in Minnesota like after this whole lockout happened they made a really conscious effort to make it a really really collaborative um, a really collaborative place so so yeah there's there's all these different committees and stuff and I was like I got <laughs> I got roped into so many of these committees like two years ago. So I was on like six or seven, I want to say, like until two months ago. And I finally finished this kind of this main committee that I was on the musicians committee. So, you know, all this stuff dealing with um, with the union and, and representing the musicians in the orchestra and sort of like being the liaison between the musicians and the administration. It's something that I just didn't, you know, I'm not thinking about that when I'm preparing my excerpts, right? So um, I wouldn't say that's like on either side of that good, bad coin. It's just something that I didn't anticipate being such a big part of the job. And, you know, certainly it's, you know, it is voluntary. So you can choose whether or not to, you know, to be involved in that. But, you know, you want to be supportive of, of the orchestra. So um, yeah, that was something that that has definitely like taken up a big chunk of my time, um, especially in the in the last year or so. But yeah, definitely for the last two years that I didn't quite expect. But it's been quite a learning experience, and I know a lot about contracts and stuff like that. <laughs> so, so orchestral politics is a side that yeah we don't we don't really train a lot on in school. We we uh -uh. don't now. Holly, are you on um, committees? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I was like, I bet you are. You're also like young. They always make us do it. <laughs> I feel like we get there and they immediately start grooming us to like be on the players committee. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm on the artistic advisory committee, which usually for us means that um, we tell them all the things that the musicians think we should play and conductors we think should conduct. And, you know, right now, especially in the time of COVID, like 
how we should be doing things and they're like, wow, yeah, that's a great idea. And then they don't do it. But, um, you know, that's most of what our job is, uh, <laughs> and coming up with, you know, repertoire ideas. Um, but yeah, so I'm on that. I'm probably going to be running for the players committee. Um, I'm on, well, I was head of the picket committee when we were locked out. So I got to do all the organizing and yelling for that. I didn't realize that I had such a loud voice, but it is effectively loud. Um, <laughs> let's see, what else? I'm on the community outreach committee. Uh, I'm on all these things that I didn't even mean to be on. They'll just be like, oh, you know, you seem to know things about this. You're on the diversity committee now. And I'll be like, I'm a white lady, but okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say that that's definitely not something I was prepared for either. Like, I feel like you get to orchestra and you're like, well, now I'm going to spend all my time practicing and being in this. And then you spend like a huge amount of your time in meetings and trying to figure out how to get along with people who don't want to get along with you. And like, a lot of it is just like this kind of patience that I didn't even know I was supposed to have. So like, you know, I agree. The community is the best part of the orchestra, like when y'all are vibing together and you're playing a concert and you feel like you're just in this emotional space together and it happens every so often and it's amazing. But then on the other side of that community coin, you do get things like there are people who are just really set on being unhappy. And like, they will be like squeaky wheel gets the grease. Like they, they do talk more than the ones that are happy and you do hear from them more. And there is a lot of diplomacy that you have to learn, especially as a young person who comes in and is like, oh my God, do you realize how lucky you are to even have a job? Like, yeah. can you just be grateful? Like, why are you complaining about getting tens of thousands of dollars a year to play music? I don't understand. And it's so important to be careful and listen, but then also not get jaded. Like. This past week, like, I didn't enjoy the program we did. I didn't enjoy pretty much anything we played except for the theme from Downton Abbey because that stuff is fire. Um, just, like, could not get enough of it. Like, we get there and we're all like, da, 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 Incidentally, you'd think that's in 6-8 because it's da, 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 da. Did you know it's in 3-4? Like, why? Just quick side. But, like, yeah, we don't know how to write for orchestra, apparently, so there we are. But, yeah, I mean, like, I didn't enjoy it. Like, I definitely got in the car after our, our last recording and screamed pretty hard because I was just like, Ugh! but the week before that, we got to play really awesome stuff. And there's just, you know, there is a balance. It is a job. Sarah's right. Like, it, it is our version of a nine to five. You don't always want to go every day to work. Half the time, like, we have four concerts a week when things are going well, um, like as in when it's not COVID time, and one or two concerts a week is an hour away. We have two halls. So we have a run out at least once or twice a week. I get car sick on that bus literally every week. It always smells like, why do people bring like Chipotle and beef bourguignon on this bus? Like, you know, there's that, but then there's also like the fact that the rest of the time you're playing music and people are getting like moved by what you're doing, hopefully if you're doing it right, you know, and we get to work with all these amazing artists and, you know, the community really is worth it. Like, okay, so I've had like really bad health problems just historically. And like, we call Mercy Hospital my summer home cause like I will end up there probably all the time. And like the number of colleagues who I've lived with them for, like weeks because I can't take care of myself and they're all my colleagues these are people that like I am friends with because we're in the orchestra together and that I cannot stress enough is so important and that's my favorite thing also touring which we don't do enough but yeah that's my like they, like maybe you couldn't possibly tour enough after uh, we've all been locked in for dog. six months <clears throat> So, um, so let's talk a little bit about tenure, you guys. What is the tenure process like in your orchestra? And Holly, we're just going to stick with you. And um, like hoops to jump through, like what is this coming from someone who is in high school or college and doesn't, hasn't really thought three times about tenure unless they were talking about how they didn't want their professor to get tenure. So 
<laughs> so tenure for us is a 16 month long process. Um, it's longer now than it used to be. I think so our music director is Marin and she wanted it to be a more involved process. So we have like, I don't know, nine or 10 people on our tenure committee and they're all people that are in the orchestra. And then Marin has kind of final say and we have a union rep in there to make sure that everything is fair. No one is saying things that they shouldn't be saying. Um, and that union rep, so the way it works, like each tenure meeting, that group of people plus Marin plus our personnel manager meet before rehearsal and talk about you behind your back. And then you meet with Marin, our personnel manager and um, a union rep. And then Marin kind of like soft pedals and is like, everyone loves you. Also, can you try to do this more? And um, then you try to do that more. So when I got tenure in the seconds here, I literally got no comments. Like they said it was the easiest tenure process they've ever had. And I was like, oh, everyone loves me. Surely when I get to the first, it would be so easy. Um, it has not been easy. When I switched to the first, they made me, so I'd been playing with the orchestra for years. I already had tenure. I've taken like auditions for move up stuff and like gotten trials for like second and fourth chairs and like all this stuff. And they made me do another trial week and completely redo my tenure process. I'd like to just note that it is the same job, only slightly different, and also doesn't pay more. So I'm not sure why I have to redo the entire tenure process. But so here it's, it's a little annoying. Like, I'm grateful for my tenure in the seconds. They're deciding tenure next week for me in the first. It was supposed to be back in April, but then COVID happened. Um, and so they're deciding next week. And like the worst thing that happens is I get to go back to a section I loved playing with anyway. But, you know, I feel like a lot of times you can't really take it personally when you hear comments unless they're just about, and third position, Peter, you're correct. I don't have to go above it anymore. I'm over it. Um, but, like, I feel like it's really, really important to kind of have that mindset idea that Sarah had started talking about. Because, like, in the end, it's other people's opinions. Like, you're doing your job and if you're doing your best and being a nice person, like I got some really weird comments. My very favorite one was that, okay, so keep in mind, this is while my leg is broken. I am like crutching onto stage and people have to carry my violin on for me. I'm in a full leg brace, like I'm not comfortable. And my comment in my tenure meeting with Marin, she said, you know, people just feel like you're too comfortable here. They need you to be more hungry. And I was like, uh, like it brings snacks on stage. Like, what does that even mean? And like, I had a really hard time not letting that like affect me in the long run. I was so mad. Like one of my older colleagues, he was a principal bass and he'd go out and sit in the audience when he was rotated off. And I'd always text him afterwards and I'd be like, hey, Bob, do I look hungry? And Bob would be like, yeah, famished. <laughs> like, and so like, there are things like that that happen. And like, when you're going through tenure, it's just so important not to like, get up in your head and be like, oh, like, am I like, doing this thing right or doing that thing right? Like, just do your job, play in the same part of the bow, use the same amount of vibrato, learn your part in advance. The rest is just like, be yourself. As long as you have a good personality, if you have a bad personality, don't be yourself. But like, with me, I have such a shining personality that like, obviously, it's fine. Um, but like, yeah, that, that's our tenure process. It's pretty annoying. Having tenure, though, is really nice. It's just so much less stressful to be like, well, you know, what if they don't like how I'm sitting? What if they don't, you know, like the blurby blurb my hair, which there are things to love here. But, you know, anyway, yeah, that's my experience. So, Sarah, what's it like in Minnesota? Pretty similar. Um, it's, yeah, it's like 18 months. Um, and I had a similar uh, experience to Holly where I, my first, when I joined the orchestra, I joined the second violin section. I actually just like took the next audition that came up. Um, so, yeah, the first audition I took, it was just for second violin. Then I, I took the next one. It was for first and second violin. So... Yeah, so I got the position in the first, and and my, I mean, 
it was also a unique situation just because I had played there like quite a bit at that point. So I'd been like around for two years before I ever got the job and people already knew me and I knew them. And, and I mostly played in first violin when I was a sub, it was just kind of like they like assigned people. Um, so you would usually play in one section or the other. So I kind of, it was funny, like when I got the job, you know, some of the second violins I'd never sat with, like they'd never sat with me. So they were kind of new to me um and i was new to them and so that was maybe more of an experience of like they were trying to like assess what they thought about playing with me and all this stuff and so it was a little bit like yeah like when i when i moved to the first it was kind of i was more used to playing with those people and but you know as a sub it was it was very scary just because you know that there i was under no sort of contract with them like if somebody you know didn't think I did a good job one week and went and said that to someone could have been over for me. So I was, you know, I, I try to be really prepared and just like, you know, be nice to people, be friendly and, and just, and also just try to feed off of like whatever my stand partner was giving me. So, you know, that, I, I think that's like a really valuable thing actually, you know, when you're, you know, it's valuable for you to learn just in terms of being able to fit into whatever section you're in, because, you know, like Holly's saying, it's like, you know, it's, it's a completely different group of people. So like <laughs> playing the second violence, you're, you're doing basically the same thing, but you're around different players and everybody has their own, you know, their, their own idea of what the section is, you know, is supposed to be like and all this stuff. So, um, yeah, I always just kind of tried to um, yeah, to just, like, really notice what my stand partner was doing, um, and just, like, try to understand their approach and see if I could learn something from it, and, you know, and sometimes, sometimes you're, like, actually, I don't really want to <laughs> do that, um, but usually, you know, it's people who have a ton of experience, so, um, so that, that, I think that sort of helps you improve and also helps you, um, you know, make a good impression on those people, hopefully. But yeah, so the, yeah, the process for me was like, I was in the second violence for like six months and then I took this audition and, and when you're already in the orchestra, you just start in the finals. Um, so I just played that. Um, so that was like my third audition in the Miss Orchestra actually. Um, and then I think after that, they, they had like a vote to grant me early tenure in the seconds and then I would have a tenure process in the first. So then it was like kind of the same thing. It's like, if I didn't get tenure in the first, then I would just go to the seconds, which would be fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, the two different sections have very different, very different attitudes and cultures <laughs> within them. It's so weird. It's just like a little microcosm of, I don't know. But yeah, so, so my, yeah, and my, my meetings were pretty, low stress thankfully it was I think just kind of because I had been a sub for a while you know we had also when I was a sub we had um uh you know evaluations then as well so I did get comments back then <laughs> I remember I got a comment someone was like you need to be more aware of your surroundings during stage changes <laughs> it's just like people say like the weirdest stuff and you're like okay <laughs> I was like I'll take it <laughs> like they say it weren't like you played badly <laughs> out of June like so it's sometimes yeah is what Holly's saying is very true you can't really like read too much into these things like people kind of just say stuff with sometimes sometimes they're really constructive and sometimes the comments are just like you have to take like the biggest grain of salt with them so you have to kind of exercise your own um <laughs> judgment on that but yeah, so that's, that's what awesome. I, that, that's awesome. Well, we're going to go to Danny to talk about the tenure process at, at Chicago now, but um, Craydites, all of you that are listening and you have your cameras all turned off and you're all muted and you're all nice and quiet, pull up your keyboards because after Danny talks about tenure, we're going to do a little lightning round. So if you've got questions, they can be as ridiculous or silly as you want pop them in the chat so I can throw them at our, at our panel here in just a minute. So, okay, Danny, tenure. Yeah, so 
I don't know if anyone talked about what tenure actually means, but it means that you pretty much can't be fired from your job unless you do something really bad. And I'm not going to get into what that means because none of you would ever do anything really bad. But what it means is for us as musicians is job security, which grants you more of a sense of like, I'm part of this family and it opens up your ability to be more expressive, I guess, if you want to say that. Not that you're not expressive when you're on probation, which is before you get tenure, but it's definitely a different feeling. Um, so in Chicago, it's two year probation. Um, and they're supposed to give you a review every year to tell you how you're doing. Um, what happens is that the music director will meet with your audition committee, who is also the same as your going to be your tenure committee but it's the audition committee will meet with the music director. They'll have a discussion on how they think things are going. And then you have a meeting with the music director and he pretty much just tells you what happened and how he thinks you're doing. Ultimately in Chicago, the music director will make the decision whether or not someone is granted tenure or not. Um, the committee is just there for input and, you know, the music director does listen to them. They're the people who have to work with them for the rest of their careers. The music director usually is there 10 plus years or something and then they're gone. So they do, they do respect the opinions of um, the committee. Uh, yeah, for me, it was pretty straightforward. I had a review meeting. It was actually a little weird because we, we had our meeting with Muti and it went really well. And then afterwards, everyone was going around congratulating us like, because I think there was some confusion that they thought that was a tenure meeting and we had all gotten tenure already. So we were really confused because I, I got it at the same time as another viola. So we were like, do we have tenure or not? So we had to go ask the management and he was like, oh no, you don't have tenure. That was a review meeting. So we had to go and tell him, oh, sorry. No, I, you shouldn't be congratulating us because that was just a review meeting, but thanks anyway. But uh, anyways. Um, yeah, in term, I don't know if there's a question about like tips or whatever. I mean, I pro if most of you are in high school, it's probably something you don't have to think about for a long time. But whenever you do play in orchestra, my only recommendation is be yourself, but be your best self. You know, don't be the self sitting in a Zoom meeting with your camera off in pajamas or, you know, the camera's on, but you're not wearing pants. You don't want to be that guy. Like, wear your pants. You know, I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a tenure meeting. It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, but also you also want to be yourself because you do want <laughs> when you, you, you want to be comfortable with the people you're going to work with and they want to be comfortable with you. You don't want to pretend like you're someone you're not also. So, yeah, that's all I have to say. That's great, Danny. So we actually had a question pop up from Ariana, and it was um, sort of around something that you had already said. She's wondering, um, talking about um, separating work life and home life and how important that is. I'm wondering, um, how does that work for you when you have to practice at home? Yeah, that's a good question. So. I think what I was referring to was more like um, the questions of identity and values and like, what do you base your life around? So I, I, I totally understand as a young musician, because I was, I'm, I'm still young. I remember what that was like. And I was very, very focused and like music, getting a job, that was just the center of like my whole life revolved around that every minute I practiced, every audition I took, every piece of music I played was to get me one step closer to becoming a professional musician. And I'm, I mean, I think it served me well, but you know, life is always gonna throw you curveballs and you're at some point you're gonna realize that that is not what life is about. It is a great part of life to get a great job and to get paid for doing what you love. And don't get me wrong, I'm so thankful for it. And 
humbled that I get this opportunity. It's fantastic. But it's all, if I also make that my who I consider I am, then my moods, the way I treat other people is all going to be based around that. And if something's not going well at work, that, does that mean I bring it home and I treat my family, you know, in a way that I don't want to be that way? Or when I'm with friends and whatever, do I feel like, oh, I'm better than you or you because I did this and I did that? You know, it can be kind of toxic too. So it's, I think it's really, um, that's what I was talking about in terms of um, separating home from work. Like definitely like practice at home all you want. You know, I, when, when I first moved to Chicago, we were in a little tiny one bedroom. Like I couldn't get away from Lauren and not like have her hear me practicing. Like if your family has an issue with that, I'm sorry. But if they supported you getting into music, they should support you practicing at 2 a.m. Okay, Peter, you should explain this pyramid. Wait, first you have to unmute yourself. Somebody. So, um, yeah, basically Dick Ryan, uh, some of you have heard the talk at Credo about the pyramid. If, if, your, ba if your life is based on the last thing you did as, as an artist, as your achievement as an artist, it's a very wobbly pyramid. It's a pyramid upside down. It's a pyramid that's based on that, but you need to turn your pyramid right side up. So you're based on the foundation of who you are and what you can do as a human being. And then when the pyramid is right side up and you have this overflow that uh, flows out the top beautifully, you can't, you can't uh, base your life on an upside down pyramid. Like that's basically what Danny was talking about just now. Thanks. Yeah. So good, that's so good. All right. All right, guys, we have, I've got just a few lightning round questions. So um, if anybody else wants to throw them into chat, they can, oh, good one. All right, so these are gonna be, we're gonna go through um, Holly, Sarah, Danny for each of these questions. All right, first one, Holly, have you named your instrument? My student named it Beatrix and it stuck. <laughs> Sarah? Rupert. Danny? No name. Uh-oh. Viola? All right. Holly, morning or night person? Night. 100%. Mornings are the devil. <laughs> Sarah? Same. Ooh. Danny? I actually used to be a night person, but now that I have a baby, I'm a morning person. <laughs> we'll do that for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, Holly, favorite pizza topping? I like pineapple with black olives. Please don't hate me. Oh, that sounds what? so interesting. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I like the black olives part. That's interesting. I might have to try that just, just to, just to, just to try it. Me. Exactly. And also, Lauren says that she likes that too. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess both you and Lauren like That's it. I'm gonna I'm have to friends. eat it. <laughs> Is that the vegetarian version of a Hawaiian pizza? Kind of. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You, Sarah. Um. So my local pizza chain, it's like a very beloved pizza chain in the Twin Cities. They will put garlic mashed potatoes on pizza for you. And so I always get garlic mashed potatoes, cheddar cheese, green onions, tomatoes, and bacon so that it's like Wait, the, and I sour tried cream that. on the side. What? I oh yeah, you were that. there. I yeah, Jenny. Like, I was like, I haven't had ordered it. in like 14 years. Here we go. Look, you're going to oh do that. Yeah. Chicago, have deep dish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, yeah, it's like my own creation. But yeah, somebody in our orchestra, when, when Holly was, was subbing with us, somebody from my orchestra really wanted to order it. She was like calling me in the middle of the night, like to ask what the pizza toppings were. But, yeah, I so it's basically like, like <laughs> it's basically like a baked potato accoutrement, you know? Except oh, a pizza and it is on really a pizza good. crust. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. Okay, Danny, pizza. <laughs> um, it used to be pineapples and ham, but now it is um, mozz. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh my God. What's that really good? Ricotta. Ricotta. Nah, that goes on. What do you call it? a margarita pizza? So it's like basil, tomato, and um, like fresh mozzarella, like in a circle, like a disc. Yeah. Mozzarella, that's the one. I get my cheeses mixed up. Delicious. 
Okay, I think Danny's gonna get all of the quotes of the night here, Peter. All right, um, let's see. Next question from Josh. This is a good one. Holly, mashed potatoes, fork or spoon? Fork. Mm, Sarah? Mm, Danny? Them with a fork. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> they just slide through the prongs. No, but you can get all the little edges with a fork. And you can make so, little patterns on it. Uh, you have no so we're playing with we're playing with our food now. Good. Oh, okay. you should also add peas. <laughs> um okay, Ariana, you're Ari, you're cracking me up. All right. Um what is your favorite time to practice, Holly? Oh, um no. No. Uh <laughs> I I guess whenever I have time now, but I, I used to be a nighttime practicer, like it, yeah. <laughs> yes, Monday is my favorite and maybe only time, just kidding. No, but I used to be a night practicer. I um, would bring cookies to all the security officers like periodically, so they'd let me stay like a little later. I think I, I usually closed out the con though. Nice. Yes. I did that too. Yeah. Yeah, I was a night practicer at school, and then I think nowadays, or, you know, in my, like, normal work life, I would practice in the middle of the day, so, like, you do your rehearsals in the morning, afternoon, I'd probably practice from, like, four to six or something, and so it's good, because I'm, like, thinking about dinner, and so that's, like, motivating me to be efficient, um, yeah. All right, Danny. Yeah, in college, I mean, you practice whenever you have free time, but I love like super late night practicing because you're kind of loopy. <laughs> Even if you've been, <laughs> never mind. You just get wow. kind of loopy at night. Like 2 a.m. practicing was like fantastic for me. I love it. A golden that. hour. This is, why, this is why you've all won, yeah, you've yeah, all won orchestra. Beehive that was open for all the like cool kids is like yeah. a 120 year old building that's about to collapse at two in the morning. I think it is gone now. All afterwards. Classic. Yeah, it's still there, but no one uses it. I think it's, yeah, closed for safety reasons. <laughs> I lived across the street. I lived on Clark. I lived at like 812 Clark. So I lived super close to this practice building and to the Taco Bell. So oh. just kind of that triangle was like, yep. you know. So relatable. But, yeah, now it's like <laughs> always pre, I don't really practice post dinner, except now that I have a baby, the only time I get to practice is after he goes to bed. So back to night practicing. <laughs> okay, two more questions, you guys, and then we'll have, we'll, we'll settle on our last, on our last discussion topic and we'll um, let everybody get out of here. So two more flash, flash answers. Favorite jazz composer, Holly? Do you mean like um, a performer or like a person who composed classical music in a jazz style? As me, I'm just gonna say you're yes. not gonna, I'm not, yeah, either. Um, I'm gonna say, I don't know, does Billie Holiday count? Yeah. Yeah, Probably. go Sarah. Can I say Stevie Wonder? He's kind of like more funk, but I'm just gonna say that. That's what you're, you're, you're leaving. You're leaving jazz in the dust now, Sarah. Yeah, okay, sorry, okay. <laughs> Danny. Uh, I have to say Miles Davis because it's Miles Davis. No, I'll be honest with you guys. My son's name is Miles David, so there you go. Um, <laughs> last one. Favorite book? Have you read books? Um, book. That's like picking a favorite child. I would never do that. Um, Good answer. Good answer. I, I do really like Haruki Murakami's writing. Um, no, Peter. No one likes subjects. Stop it. Subject. <laughs> no. no. Trotiak. <laughs> Don't. Sarah. Um. Uh, I mean, growing up, my favorite book was always Wrinkle in Time. It's kind of a kid's book, but I also. No, it's not. I'll no, it. Yeah, no, if you know, you know, it's like, you know, it's timeless. Um, I also recently read a book called Circe that was amazing and I loved it. If anybody, I think it was like a, you know, bestseller or something a couple years ago, but that's an amazing book. So my favorite book for technique is actually Dunis, the artist's manual. 
for real. It's a, I'm it's so a upset gem. right now. <laughs> it's a gem that a lot of people don't know about, but it'll rip your hand up and really get it in shape. Look it up, Dunis Artist's Manual or something like that. And then uh, the most influential book in my life was Steppenwolf by Herman Hesse. Um, Good one. But my, for everyday life, I have to say the Bible, because it's classic. For the win. Yep, you win. Um, okay, guys, so our last discussion topic of the evening we're gonna let everybody out of here um if you had could give your 15 year old self a piece of advice this is something I've, that we've been doing a little bit on the kratos um facebook page lately so if you could give yourself the 15 year old version of you some advice what would you tell them I'll go first. I would tell 15 year old Holly that everything's going to be okay. Like, just be nice to yourself. Keep trucking along. It's going to be fine. Oh, we too. Um, <laughs> just be nice to yourself. Remember when you go to college in a few years, exercise self compassion. I mean, I, I was already going to work hard. Just be nice. That would be mine. That's a good that was going to be mine too. <laughs> was be kind to yourself. Um, I think, yeah, just be kind to yourself and, you know, and, and sort of, I guess, uh, you know, that was around the time that I, I think comparing myself to other people sort of like reached kind of like a, an all time like high, you know, so I think, you know, as you're, when you're a teenager, especially like in every other way besides music too, you're always, you know, you know, as a girl, like in high school, of course, you're, you're comparing yourself to people. If I could go back and tell myself not to do that, I don't know if I would have listened to myself, but. No, of course not. We <laughs> but, you know, every music is like, right. The music is like another layer on, on top of that, that I, I think can be really it can really do a number on you. So yeah, I think be kind to yourself and, um, and don't measure yourself by any other person's standards. That, especially like as a woman, we're always like, that one's prettier or whatever. And I think it's so important. Like, first of all, I'm sure you've also gotten way less competitive since then, but like also other people's successes and beauty does not detract from yours. It is, they are this and I am also this and they're not in the same place. So yes, that, love, love that. Danny. Yeah, um, I would say to try and give other people, yeah, two things would be to give other people the benefit of the doubt. Um, and the other would be, uh, Try and learn at least one thing from someone else, especially your enemies. Or, I mean, hopefully you don't have enemies, but we all have like those people we are competing against or we, we compare ourselves to. And like, as much as I want to say, like, don't compare yourself, it's really hard not to. Like, even today, I still do it. And I, I have a job, like, why, why do I care? But like, the, I think the key is to understand that we all have different strengths and weaknesses, but to try and learn from each other's, especially the people you don't like. That's great. That is great. Well, you guys, I am going to, um, first of all, say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for Thanks doing for having this. us. This has been so fun for me. I know, I mean, I'm with a three-year-old all day, every day. And so getting to talk to you guys about your job and hear about what you're doing. And I really appreciate on the behalf of all of us who, Kratites and who are getting ready to take auditions and um, who are gonna be watching this over the next couple of weeks on YouTube, 
it's just going to, it's just so nice to hear your perspective and it's been so encouraging. So I'm really, really grateful for each of you.